my mom, who had hoped that I would stay in school past the O level, yeah. uh, came to now wonder <laughs> why, why don't you why stop? don't I stop? <laughs> she sent her brother to counsel me and say, why don't you get a real job? Yeah. All right, so welcome everybody. Today we have Jameis Lim in the house. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Coach Jason. <laughs> okay, a little bit about him. He's an associate professor uh, of economics at Essex Business School and a member of Parliament of Singapore, representing Singkam. Uh, previously, he was also the chief economist of the Third Rock Group and Investment and Wealth, Wealth Advisory. So yeah. I am... Thanks for having me in the show. Thanks, thanks for being here. Thanks for taking up your precious time uh, to be here to hopefully inspire the next generation. Right. Uh, I'm always curious about why somebody would actually go into a certain job that they do. And my fundamental um, need to be able to try to share is that why people can actually go to jobs that they are passionate about. Or is it even an elusive thing that we should actually follow our passion mm. and things like that. So I just want to find out from you, like, um, what happened when you were young all the way to where mm. you are now as a professor in economics? So first, I'm glad you raised the idea of how we are as youths because I think we are truly a creature of how we were brought up and mm -hmm. the kind of setting that we were brought up. As it turns out, my mother, grew, for most of her career, worked in the stock brokering house. Mm. She worked in the back office, but nevertheless, I had been very fascinated with finance, at least at the time. And it was always something that struck me as exciting and not just exciting but uh, mysterious in an exciting way so uh, given that Singapore's a financial center I think it's not unusual mm -hmm. for a number of us to see this of course the fact that usually people who work in banking and finance are fairly well remunerated mm -hmm. adds to that mystique and yeah. that desirability if you will so I accompanied her to the office on Saturdays at times. And my first temp job was probably when I was way too young. Let's not <laughs> divulge when I, I, I did that. But uh, I... And it wasn't that bring, bring your family to work there? No, no. It was in... <laughs> In, it was in her office. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so actual job. Okay. Actual job. Okay. It, it was painful because right. we were in the back office and at the time, although everything was automated, yeah. it was nevertheless still a lot of manual data entry. So I, till today, I can key in numbers on the, on the number pad really fast. So uh, it's something that I was thrown into the deep end of mm -hmm. what it was like working in the back office. And while it did diminish my passion for back office operations, yeah. it only, I think, added to my interest in the field in general. Mm. And so I quickly started learning about how I could potentially have a career. Yeah. And I learned that, well, you honestly don't need that much skills to be a stockbroker if that was what I wanted. You need to make good calls, yes. but you don't really need a lot of education. Right. So I briefly contemplated, well, what if I dropped out of O-level after <laughs> I finished my O-levels and just became a stockbroker and mom would have none of that. Yeah. So the next best thing was to think about allied professions. And right. so I got interested in economics. And at the time for me, economics was largely synonymous with finance. And it was only when I started studying it as an undergraduate. So my undergraduate studies were uh, on economics, but it was with a business degree. Mm -hmm. So I had to actively pursue as many economics courses as I could. I even ended up majoring economics. but and, and through that journey, I exposed myself much more to a range of fields within economics mm -hmm. and I learned that economics was much deeper than just about finance. In fact, finance is barely emphasized in economics except for one specific branch, financial economics. And instead, it, what fascinated me most within economics was an understanding of individual behavior, optimizing individual behavior, how they may 
one may deviate from mm. that optimizing behavior in a systematically predictable fashion. That's now the field of behavioral economics. And in turn, uh, the application to macro phenomena that we observe yep. that matters. Uh, I, when th Late in my undergraduate years, I experienced, like many Singaporeans did, the, global, uh, the Asian financial crisis mm. uh, 97, 98. And that was obviously, I think, a life-shaping event. I wanted to understand why we went through a crisis. And so that began a process of interest in international economics, which is a field in economics that is interested in the relationship between countries. Part yeah. of that relationship is trade, but a big part of it is what we call international finance, the exchange mm -hmm. of capital between countries, what gives rise to currency crises. Uh, and so that led me to work on a thesis as an undergraduate on this topic. So it was on exchange rate regimes. And um, it became clear that if I wanted to be serious about being an economist, I couldn't just stop at undergraduate studies. So went on to the master's degree and from that it became clear that I couldn't just stop at the master's. <laughs> and so I went on to the PhD and then after that, apparently I learned that there's such a thing as a postdoc and you go on to that. And of course my mom who had hoped that I would stay in school past the O-level, yeah. uh, came to now wonder, <laughs> why, why, don't, you why stop? don't I stop? <laughs> she sent her brother to counsel me and say, why don't you get a real job yeah. instead of yeah. staying in school? Stop, stop staying in school. So I was lucky in that now I still get to pursue questions in economics and, and that's what I do. That's my job. Hmm. So I'm, I fell in love with the subject never look back and it was something that I keep doing because thankfully uh, I'm not I didn't go down the route of I don't know um, 18th century romantic poetry where mm -hmm. the potential market is just a yeah. little bit smaller so I'm <laughs> lucky there and so I've continued on in international economics right so the only time that you uh, peaked the, the interest of economics was only in uh, undergrad well, I think undergrad is when the parameters for what you need to do yep. to succeed in a given profession become a lot clearer. Mm. Before that, you kind of have a vague notion of yep. what you want to do for your career, mm. or what you want to do when you grow up, you know. And it's only in undergrad where requirements become clear. You mm. need to take these courses. Mm. If you want to practice as an economist, mm. Uh, and be respected, mm. you need to have an advanced degree. You can't yep. just stop at the undergraduate level and right. so on and so forth. So I think it was only at that stage where I had to take the, the path of becoming a, a professional economist a lot more seriously. Right. And before that, there was no notion of economists being an economist at all. No. Well, just all finance. You know, to be fair, my parents, they both dropped out uh, of high school, right? Mm -hmm. Equivalent of high school. My father didn't even finish his O-levels. My mom uh, did, but then she stopped there. She They went straight into the workforce. Yeah. They were not in a position to counsel me mm -hmm. on what my options were. And I think that's something that's underappreciated. I think those in our parents' generation, they worked hard, but they never truly understood what options were out there available for them to pursue. And we are so lucky yeah. in that we now have been presented with a much fuller slate. We have career guidance counselors and yeah. the like. And the information, if you really wanted to, is all available online as well. Mm -hmm. We now have mentorship systems to give, uh, internship systems to give people a taste in the past when yeah. I, I wanted to do it. I got a job, right, yeah. in the field. But now you have an opportunity to have, if you will, a tasting yeah. of uh, what life is like in that profession. And I think that's immensely valuable. It lets you uh, kind of find your way to uh, whether you truly would want to do this for the rest of your life. Anyone that has done a PhD will tell you before you embark on a PhD, especially if it's uh, some a student that is asking, should I pursue a PhD? You mm -hmm. always tell them, look, at some point, especially in your later years of the PhD, all you do 
is sit with your thoughts, mm. usually in a dank basement, <laughs> doing nothing other than think about this topic. Yeah. And it's not even a broad topic. Usually, yeah. the broad topic that most people approach yeah. a subject with gets narrowed down into something really, really esoteric. Yeah. This little knob of information. And you become a world expert in that little, little <laughs> niche, literally yeah. a niche. Uh, but you got to really like it because yeah. if you don't, yeah. nothing is going to keep you going. And almost invariably, those people who don't have that deep thirst mm -hmm. to push it through, they drop out. Right, right. So bring me back a little bit when you were younger. Uh, and if we think about jobs, a lot of times when people get a degree, sometimes they will be like, I'm just getting a degree at this point of time. I might not want to do mm. that degree. Right, because I I might have, I might have the opportunity to explore different interests mm -hmm. that I have. Uh, I believe that when it comes to this whole idea of passion, there are a few things in passion, uh, three th three pillars, and one of them is interest. Um, you have an interest. You had an interest in finance uh, when you went to your your stockbroking and all that, right? Then after your interest in economics, being an economist, uh, economics, right, and behavioral economics. Any other interest that you had when you were younger, be like, hey, maybe I should just explore that instead. Mm. So, when I was younger, I uh, loved the arts. It's not surprising. My dad was a musician. So, he mm. was an artist, fundamentally, at heart. So, I did music. He disabused me of any notion of making that my career. He, he <laughs> didn't want me to be a starving musician. Uh, but he did allow me to foster that interest and like, ended up playing instruments as a result. Uh, but I really love to read. Mm. So the natural progression for that, and I did fairly well in English language and literature. So the natural progression would have been, well, why don't I major in English yeah. when I was uh, in university? And that was something I seriously considered. My mom, of course, would have none of that. It, <laughs> it was something I seriously considered. And it, in some ways, I was very lucky. I was very good at writing kind of more flowery pieces. I right. wrote poetry in mm -hmm. my secondary school years, and I liked exploring different elements of language. But I was able, when I was an undergraduate, to transition into writing expository uh, pieces. Mm -hmm. And I think that, in fact, Writing is an underrated skill in a lot of professions and especially so in a social science like economics where a big part of it is scientific in nature. You analyze yep. the data, you develop rigorous, formal, mathematically based models, but a big part of it is also asking interesting questions and part of being able to ask those questions is to motivate those questions and motivating them not just for yourself but for those that are around you your peers mm -hmm. at least and so writing becomes a key input into that mm -hmm. so ever since i became a professional economist i practice an economist i see myself as much as a writer mm -hmm. as i see myself as a technician if you will right. so I, i'm lucky in that being an economist allows me to marry both of these yeah. interests together. So in a way, I don't feel like I've compromised in <laughs> any way. Uh, you know, one of the other things that professors get to do is they get to write books. Yeah. So if I really need a long form outlet, mm -hmm. uh, working on the book now, I I am enjoying that process of mm -hmm. writing down my thoughts. And I, Kai, my best friend, he's German, and he likes to say that, I tend to write in a bombastic and pedantic way. And I'm like, yeah, but the, what's the joy of writing yeah. in a terse, <laughs> boring way like ChatGPT yeah. would yeah. crank out stuff, right? No, no, I yeah. want to write my style and nice things that with your own book, you yeah. turns out you can. Right, so there was a path. Uh, if I were to think about like multiverse, uh, James in a different universe could have joined, could have gone through that path of English language and English, English literature and all that. Yes, and again, I maybe I would eventually have 
wandered back into this area. I okay. may have started off mm -hmm. uh, yep. in English and then realized that, hey, I need a little bit more of a theoretical edifice yep. with which to hang or structure my thinking. That, mm -hmm. That's one of the strengths of economics. I think it really helps to structure your thinking, of course, in a specific way, mm -hmm. in a way that the field trains you to think. But nevertheless, it is a way of thinking through problems. We yeah. call it thinking like an economist. And I think that has served me well in life. And perhaps even if I were a writer, I would have wandered into that direction of wanting to structure how I approach mm -hmm. problems and analyze problems with this form of thinking. Mm -hmm. So perhaps I would have gotten there after all. Hmm. Besides music, uh, English and economics, was there any other interest that you had that you that you thought when you were younger that hey, actually this could be potentially my job in the future? Yeah, so um, I did want to be a lawyer at some point. <laughs> okay. I was, as I mentioned, I, I'm interested in language yep. and articulating arguments. Mm -hmm. I, I was fairly argumentative as a child. Some would argue I'm still argumentative <laughs> as an adult. Right. Uh, so that, it was natural to consider whether mm. that could be yep. a possible job. Yep. And of course, lawyers have quite a lot of respect in society, mm -hmm. at least in our society. Yeah. So it's... And that's something that our parents understood, right? Yeah, 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 doctors, yeah. lawyers. So, so, yeah. Exactly, yeah. doctors, lawyers. Yeah. Maybe third, uh, the and third engineer. tier would be engineer, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. If you couldn't make it in yeah. the other top two Asian yeah, exactly. uh, professions, you go engineer. Yeah. But but they understood it compared to economies, uh, yeah. uh, compared to, oh, I'm majoring in English. Like, what does that mean? Oh, is it yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so for sure... Uh, when I mentioned that yeah. law was something I was interested Go in, they were like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, we will support you. Yeah, Very good. Yeah. Um, well, as it turns out, after my A-levels, yeah. which was the first time in my academic life where I had a clear setback. Up till then, I had generally done well enough to just get into the schools that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And... and that was the first time where I didn't do well enough hmm. to have qualified for law. I qualified oh. for NUS economics at the mm -hmm. time and other economics uh, departments and uh, other schools, but I didn't get into mm. law. Uh, actually, I didn't even try because mm. I wouldn't have met the yeah. cutoffs. And so it, that's when it led me to reconsider. And I'm, I'm grateful because mm. I think if I had gone on in law, now, on hindsight, when I look back at it, all the interesting questions in law for me mm. are those that have to do with jurisprudence as well as um, justifications, especially economic justifications for mm. the law. In fact, there's a field in economics uh, called law and economics, and it's uh, one of my co-advisors in grad school, as it turns out, that's his area. And he... The, the, the field essentially questions the premise behind the laws that we have and usually structures that questioning along the lines of, well, is this economically efficient? Does this make sense from an mm. economic perspective? And so this has, in a way, come a full circle now yes. for me yeah. because <laughs> uh, in some ways I'm a lawmaker, but at the same time, it's something where I feel that my training in economics... Yeah. Uh, lends me a a certain lens yep. to probe the law that maybe if I were trained as a lawyer, I might not be as questioning, or at least mm. I would question it in a very different way. Yeah. So the economy is part of you sees policy now in a different way. And um, um, what what I hear a lot is the idea of like challenging something, mm. right? the, the idea of challenging something, whether it makes sense uh, as in if I wear my hat as an economist. If it doesn't make sense, then let's try to see what we can do. Yes. And that's, and that's where you're coming from there, where that legal aspect, that that um, economist aspect, and then also the last one is the English aspect, which is the, can the man on the ground understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So I've been lucky, right? <laughs> I've been lucky in that not everyone that feels that there's a problem with some element of public policy or the mm. law is also able to have a forum where they can express yep. that discontent, if yep. you will. Uh, so I've been lucky. 
in that the voters of Singkang have mm. felt that mm. uh, I represent enough mm. of a perspective that they would like to hear that yeah. I've been able to, in fact, articulate these things in a forum where these matters are being deliberated and debated. So I like to think that I bring a perspective to the table that may not always be immediately appreciated or understood, but at least I put it on the table. Yeah, uh, I put it there for consideration. I would usually have done my homework in thinking about whether this is something that is defensible, makes sense. It, it, does it kind of pass the internal checks, right? And right. once it has, and we have deliberated it among ourselves, I feel that I'll be in a position to then advance it and to mm -hmm. carry it. And yeah. and you have, of course, you have to have enough belief in that idea to carry it. So I try to make sure that I can back up what I say mm -hmm. as much as I, I put it on the table with evidence that I draw from the rest of the world, mm -hmm. with also internal coherence mm -hmm. in terms of the arguments. But yeah, that's that's what I do. And again, yeah. I'm, I feel very lucky that I'm able to do so. Right. So the, um, the the careers that besides music, the careers that you almost were going to embark on is kind of coming back full circle in terms of uh, serving the nation. Interesting. Uh, it, again, yeah. yeah, yeah it, it, so I think one of the things that uh, animates purpose yeah. in life, and we were discussing this before, yeah. is that when you think about why we are here on earth mm -hmm. and you think about all the things that you could do with life and what kind of legacy you want to leave behind, yeah. after an extended period of soul searching, I arrived at the notion that for me at least, it was to do good unto others. Mm -hmm. And that notion of doing good unto others, of course, as we discussed as well, is common in many religions, yep. but I think it is uh, almost a-religious in a way. Mm. It, you can step back from religion and say, actually, even without the framework of religion, doing good for others well, has some biological content. You want to perpetuate the human race and yep. so on, but it also has uh, a kind of more spiritual, ethereal mm aspect yeah. that doesn't require a belief in religion. Yeah. It's just the idea that I do good to my yeah. fellow man and woman because that ultimately is what will last mm -hmm. through time. Yeah. So that comes to the second part when I talk yeah. about this whole idea of passion, uh, where um, one is the interest that you have. Um, and if you want to follow your passion, there's another part, whether or not that passion uh, is part of this thing called values and what do you value most? And you mentioned that is really the idea of serving others, doing unto others. Mm. Uh, how about as a professor, how do you live out that passion of serving others when you are teaching your students? Oh, when I was a teenager, one of the things that we had was we had these visits by different people to the... You know, I was in junior college, right? So there were visits by different different guest speakers and they were trying to talk about their jobs and so on just to give us some idea and inspire us. And as it turns out, one of them, one of the speakers was a teacher and he was a, a teacher in a regular school, not in mm -hmm. a university. And at the end of his talk, I remember, he asked the and the auditorium was full. It was full because we were all forced to go. Yeah. But <laughs> the auditorium was full and he said, anyone will consider being a teacher. And there was deadly silence, right? Mm. And nobody raised their hands. Mm. And it was... And I think he lost his patience a little bit. He, <laughs> and he was justifiably disappointed. He, he said something that did stick with me. He said, well, look, if you guys the creme de la creme of uh, the schooling system would not contemplate mm. teaching and passing on of knowledge yep. to the next generation, then you are in no position to criticize should your children not succeed because you didn't step up to the plate mm. to do this. Yep. You felt that it was better to outsource it to someone else. Yep. And, and so I see that as huge, right? The, 
So that hit you? Oh, it hit me. Uh, yeah. So I, I actually then asked the question. <laughs> I felt guilted enough to, yeah. uh, to ask a question. But, but beyond that, I think it, it stuck with me. And I see myself now. In fact, if someone asks me, yeah. someone who doesn't know who I am, asks mm. me, so what do you do? I say, yeah. I'm a teacher. Mm. Because that's uh, one of my more fundamental identities. I see myself as someone that teaches. And of course, teaching not just a subject, yeah. in my case, economics, but also imparting values. Yeah. Uh, of course, the one that I impart, hopefully, most of my my sense of values too is to my own daughter. Mm. But beyond that, I'm also I also have the privilege of imparting those values to students that come through my classroom, yeah. and to hopefully inspire them, maybe to become teachers, maybe to become economists. But even if they don't, to at least help them to understand the world a little bit better and to understand their place in it and how they can contribute to mm -hmm. that with their God-given talents and so mm -hmm. on. So so I think that's huge. I think mm -hmm. that the element uh, of values mm -hmm. certainly infuses a lot of what we do. And I've been lucky, as I explained, that my values were such that they, whether it's in public service or... Uh, in teaching that yeah. these were things that I was able to help others with it was entirely consistent with mm -hmm. with these values uh, you didn't mention this in the introduction but one of uh, my earlier jobs uh, it was at the World Bank and there our job was to work on relieving poverty worldwide mm. and so that's the mission of the bank uh, to imagine the world free of poverty and so we we're really, uh, we were really inspired every day to go to work because <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was something that really gave a lot of us purpose. Yeah. And of course, after some time as you do it, like every job, you do get jaded. You mm. sometimes think that you're not making much of a difference. But certainly while we were there and many, if you ask them to dig deep and think back on what led them into mm. that career to begin with, that career in international civil service. Mm. It really started also with a desire to mm. help those uh, that couldn't help yeah. themselves, right? And you make such a difference. Imagine mm. with some policies that you propose, especially yeah. in the developing country, you're affecting not just dozens, you're affecting millions potentially mm. of lives. And by the same token, with bad policy advice, you could be messing up millions of lives. So you take, I think, you take that responsibility and that burden very seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think that after studying so much that you would actually go into almost like public service uh, in the World Bank? So... Why not just go straight to just teaching? Yeah, yeah. So here's the funny thing, right? I, I did. I, I spent a year uh, teaching in the Liberal Arts College in okay. Kentucky. And... It was one of those things where because of the values of your professors, mm -hmm. which is that they place the highest possible value as uh, to be in academia, right? That was yep. their sense of identity, their sense of purpose, yep. their sense of meaning. And so when I ultimately chose to leave academia for the World Bank, I really had to rationalize it within myself, within yeah. myself and a little bit to my professors uh, yeah. who were just happy that I ended up in academia to begin with. And it ultimately, it came down to um, a number of factors. Mm. Uh, it, was, it seemed like an opportunity I couldn't give up, that yeah. there was a possibility to make a difference. As I shared, yeah. I was still relatively young, so DC seemed like an exciting place. Mm -hmm. The fact that they doubled my salary didn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. um, but at the same time, I felt that I was able with my knowledge yeah. to do good yeah. in the world and for others. Mm -hmm. And I think that really became the thing that swung it. That, right. that says that, okay, I, at least I try. Mm -hmm. And if I fail, that, then I would have known that maybe that wasn't for me. But at mm -hmm. least I had to try. And when the offer came round, and I was, and and I ended up spending seven years there. So clearly, oh. I I kept enjoying it. Uh, it it was, I think, 
meaningful to a point where it led me uh, to think about public service here. Right. It was one of those where I had seen and uh, contributed to word public policy making in so many countries worldwide that had that wealth of, of exposure yeah. uh, and experience. And it was, well, why wouldn't I bring it mm. back yeah. to the country that I know and love? Mm -hmm. So that was natural there. Right. Thank you. The the third one I'm curious about is that we ha we talked about interest, we talked about values, and the last one is uh, this idea of strengths. And I define strengths as things that's almost like it's your innate wiring. Like since young you are like that, and you you are wired for certain things. So some people are wired for numbers, some people are wired for design, right? And that wiring doesn't really change. It expresses itself more, but you don't really change camps, right? What will you what would you say is your strengths uh, where since young you saw that this was a pattern in your life and you were wired for that? Mm. Uh, so I tend to be quite varied in my interests mm -hmm. and by extension, I think my strengths. And if I may, I, I would want to put it to you and to everyone that there's really a lot more endogeneity uh, by which I mean an extent to which the more you do something, the mm -hmm. more it, the feedback mechanism alters mm -hmm. what you may think of as a strength. And earlier on, we were discussing how uh, you could see this as a competency, but you just said, well, maybe you're a numbers guy, maybe you're uh, more design, of a design yeah. guy. But no, th that's my point. Actually, yeah. I, I don't think I'm a numbers guy. Hmm. I when I was young, I had some facility with numbers, yeah. but things like calculus mm -hmm. and going through epsilon delta proofs, yeah. they they took a lot out of me. Mm. I, if I did it enough, I mm. could grasp the concepts and I could replicate it, mm -hmm. but it wasn't something that came as natural as, I don't know, someone mm. like Ramanujan, right? Mm -hmm. So there are people who are perhaps yeah. really, really, born with that innate talent. But yep. when I wanted to become an economist, and that was something that I was passionate about, mm -hmm. it became clear that I couldn't be a good economist without also having an analytical mind that yep. was good at solving models, that yep. was also good at staring at data and breaking it down and understanding it. And then it was like the ends... Uh, became the the means were necessary to get to, to the end, ends, yeah. and so for me, I just suddenly found a renewed purpose mm -hmm. in doing differential calculus because mm -hmm. differential calculus is what you need <laughs> if you want to succeed as a professional economist. And right. so I got to a level where now I can very very comfortably read journal articles. Mm -hmm. I still need a pen and paper or pencil probably mm -hmm. and paper to work through. Uh, the equations and to derive them and so on and it's not always uh, natural or easy but yeah. it's something that I would now say that I have a facility of numbers but mm -hmm. again I didn't start off as a numbers guy so that's yeah. my point that I think the kind of strengths that we innately have mm -hmm. um, may be a lot more mutable than many of us think so that's it Perhaps I, I, I would like to say that the strengths I have are reflected back to me. So people mm -hmm. tell me, hey, you're pretty good at this. Right. So I take that as feedback mm -hmm. and I think, okay, well, maybe I'm okay at this. Mm -hmm. And and together with self-reflection, yeah. then you kind of form a package of what you think your respective strengths are. Mm -hmm. And I think to get to the the crux of your question, I think it's valuable to know that because if you know what those strengths are, when you know what you're relatively better at, yeah. then you would be able to push along that advantage. Yes. Uh, economists call that your comparative advantage. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, the interesting thing about comparative advantage, funnily enough, I was teaching it in class this morning, <laughs> is that comparative, some people like like to think of advantage as, well, I'm just good at this, right? So mm. that's an absolute advantage. Mm. So you could be really good at math and you could be really good at painting. Yep. So, you, so math and painting, you're really good at both of them. Mm. 
then you're Da Vinci, you know, something like that. But maybe you are just that little bit better at one of them. Yes. And the theory of comparative advantage says that you should focus on what you're relatively better at. Yeah. But just flip that around. Imagine that you think you're really bad at everything. Mm -hmm. So not very good at science and not very good at arts. But you suck at one relatively less. Yes. So you choose mm -hmm. which one you suck relatively <laughs> less and you focus on... There's still yeah. comparative advantage. Yeah. So you do what you suck at least. Yeah. Um, and that's a lesson in life, right? I mean, I think yeah. that just because you can't be at the frontier as someone mm. else, it doesn't mean that you don't push along your yeah. respective strengths. And I think there's an enormous power in knowing mm. what these are, identifying what these are for you so that you can push along those lines. Right. I, I do have this... Um theory whenever I, I share or framework whenever I share with uh, people I coach the idea that um, we have probably two or three mountains in our life where we have that comparative in that advantage it's almost like the, we have the unique selling point we have the we have an unfair advantage over other people it's almost like the, you see that person go up on stage and do a uh, MC for D&D &D. and you ask him wow you did a, such a good job how do you do that it's like no my first time I'm like what how is that possible? And we know that something about speaking is that mountain for that person. Mm. And all of us probably have two or three only. But we have hundreds of valleys. So the idea behind this idea of strengths is that why not, instead of trying to fix all the things that is your weaknesses, why not just maximize the strengths that you have? And that could be, depending on your level, of caliber, that comparative advantage can be here and also can be here. Yeah. And, and, and anyway. Just as important, I would say, you know where you are. Yes. You know where you stand relative to others. But there's absolutely no reason why your aspirations should not be set high. Right. So back to my field, perhaps I may never publish in some of the very tippy top journals mm -hmm. in my profession doesn't mean I don't try. Yeah. But and it, and just as important, it doesn't mean that you don't benchmark yourself yeah. to what justifiably is the top of your profession, right? Because only by doing so yeah. can you try to push yourself closer toward mm -hmm. that. You don't set something where your standards are not world class. Yeah. And then you say, well yeah, okay, I'm the king of the mountain, but yeah. you're the king of the local mountain. Yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah. you wanna you want to at least know uh, how far you can go and what you want to aspire to it. When, when I think about this whole idea of um, uh, passion and uh, how you have found that passion and it's kind of almost like you fell into it. Right? You, you study economics, uh, economics and then, hey, I kind of like that. And you talked about behavioral economics, which I really enjoy as well. Mm. This whole idea of Dan O'Reilly and then it's like irrational predictability. I love that. The idea that human beings are not rational. Right, and to have a study about that. Just want to uh, understand from you, like um, when you think about uh, behavioral economics, right, then, we, then you go into this whole idea of policy, right? Um, what is one interesting thing that you have found in mm. the work that you did? It's like, oh, actually, when you turn this down, this thing moves, and I didn't, nobody knew that moved, but that really moved, either in your World Bank on the things that you do, because there's that butterfly effect that nobody saw, but actually when you do this, that happens. So, so I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I'll make a couple of points. First, and this is a little bit of a tangent, uh, Dan Ariely, unfortunately, in recent times, if you look him up, has uh, some of his work has recently been questioned oh. uh, for fraudulent oh, no. uh, data. <laughs> so We'll leave that as a, okay. just a tangent and an S and aside. I think it doesn't diminish yep. uh, the fact that he did popularize for many people yep. the field of behavioral economics. Yep. I mentioned my best friend Kai earlier on. He, as it turns out, he is an actual behavioral economist. So he mm. has just, he, one of his master's degree was, you know, like me, he, he's a bit overeducated. So one of his master's degree. <laughs> was in uh, psychology. Hmm. And so he has always brought a sensitivity to an alternative way of thinking that yep. goes beyond just straight up rational approaches, even though he is also German. Hmm. And so going back to the question about public policy, I think yep. having that sensitivity 
helps us, I think, to be much better public policy makers because economists are often too innocent mm. about exactly how their ideas will play out yeah. when they put it on the table. Mm -hmm. And perhaps I have these blinders myself because mm. I certainly don't have uh, all the information that is available in making yeah. decisions when, as much as, say, the government would, nor would I uh, have absolutely absolute clarity over exactly how a given policy, once it's rolled out, will play out. Yeah. But nevertheless, I think having a greater sensitivity to when something might or might not work because mm -hmm. of systematic behavioral deviations from something is one reason why, at least for me, I eschew policies that mm -hmm. I think sometimes in Singapore we have too much of that kind of over-engineer things, mm -hmm. that try to fine-tune to a certain minutia. And sometimes you can use technological solutions yep. to bring about that that fine-tuning. Mm -hmm. So ERP is one example, right? Yep. So that technology allows you to genuinely fine-tune to the minute and the second yep. uh, how much you are going to take in terms of the toll. Yep. But sometimes we forget that fine-tuning has also exerts a potential psychic cost. When people feel that... Now, you can imagine that someone that pays a one-off into something, right? Mm -hmm. To stay on the topic of traffic. Mm -hmm. Imagine you buy a season parking. Yeah. Um, that season parking, let's say, is 50 bucks, mm -hmm. And you end up using less than $50. Maybe if you had... A, an hourly kind of thing and you mm -hmm. go in and out on a uh, with a timed yep. meter you may end up only paying $45. Yeah. But the fact that every time you go in and you go out it beeps and you see this is how much it costs mm -hmm. that has exerts a certain psychic cost on you mm -hmm. when you are constantly reminded of this expense right. as opposed to that one off. So even though that repeated charging may ultimately be more efficient, yeah. it may cause more discontent mm. as a result of this, it, the frequency with which it reminds you that mm. you have to make this toll. So, another, so there's a psychological aspect. There's a psychological there's a... aspect to designing policies yes. that we have to be sensitive to, mm. that even if you are going to give up a little bit of efficiency mm -hmm. in exchange for some other objective, mm like simplicity, mm. uh, like flexibility, mm. like equity. If we have these other objectives also in mind, mm. and then it becomes a matter of, I know what the economists would argue in yeah. terms of what we should be doing in yeah. terms of eff efficient outcome. And absolutely, you should work that out. Yeah. And the economist in me tells you that you really should at least understand what your baseline is. Yes. And then permit yourself to deviate if mm. you feel that some of these other objectives ha should have more mm. of a weight. If we think that we should have a little bit more weight on equity as mm. opposed to efficiency. The think about uh, our social welfare system. Our social mm. welfare system is extremely stringent. Mm. So they go through, they really are very intrusive. So if you go to the social services office for yeah. help, they will ask you to give your bank accounts for everything. Uh, everything, yeah. everything. Do you have a pet? Everything. Yeah, everything. Uh, how, list your expenses yeah. down to, to the cent. Mm. Unfortunately, this is meant ultimately, of course, to sieve out the one or two yes. yeah. welfare kings of To make, the, kings of make the system most efficient. Yeah. Right. But then you don't serve the eight other people yeah. that Say that really would be in a fix, yeah. generally wouldn't abuse the system, yeah. but find that this hurdle, this mm. hurdle rate is just too high for them to pay. Right. They just value. And we have literally been told mm. this uh, by residents. Uh, right. it's, I just don't want to yeah. do this. It's too intrusive. And just for what they, in their words, is a pittance. It's for right. $300. Right. Uh, why should I go through all this? Uh, right. So the psychological cost sometimes is never... Um, so it's the, almost the relational aspect compared to the results aspect. The mathematical formula as in a highly efficient system where emotions are taken out of the room compared to 
psychological cost. Uh, that is something that, uh, would you say that's the whole idea of behavioral economics? And, and my point is, yes, that you yeah. shouldn't just have one. You should consider yeah. both of these. Yeah. Or more generally, as I mentioned, a suite yeah. of uh, objectives yeah. that go beyond mm. just efficiency mm. when you try to structure public policy. Simplicity yeah. as well. Yeah. Something that is just simpler to roll out yeah. uh, may just be a little bit better because it is just less subject to yes. being gamed. Mm. Uh, why most economists favor something like uh, a carbon tax. So there's mm. an alternative to a carbon tax. It's, um, it's the idea of cap and trade. You cap the total amount that mm -hmm. one can pollute and then you allow firms to trade with one another. Mm. Any economist, even an undergraduate, will be able to solve out and show you which one is more efficient. Yep. But economists often still go for the carbon tax because it's less likely to be gamed. So they mm. under even economists understand that sometimes simplicity is a virtue in and of itself. Mm. The minimum wage, the yep. reason why I... I'm in favor of a minimum wage. Yeah. It's just because of the simplest everyone can see. Mm. This is the living wage that gives someone who works yeah. dignity yeah. Uh, for what they do. Mm -hmm. As opposed to some sophisticated system where you have all sorts of ladders and tiers. And great, they, they promote uh, certain kinds of productivity gains yeah. and efficiency gains. But let's fix this. Mm. baseline first. You want to layer on your bells and whistles, do that. Mm. But let's get the baseline fixed, which is we need to have a minimum wage where we can credibly say as a wealthy society and yeah. economy, this is what someone should earn mm. to be able to operate uh, as a member of society and the mm -hmm. economy and it's for their dignity. Yeah, and that's the outcome, the psychological outcome that's different. Yes, and that, that's, that's why the dignity, and, so many things. Yeah, and some, I guess, to go back to our original point, that's mm. where the wisdom, I think, yeah. comes in. That right. you, sh you should exercise doses of mm. this practicality, this real world yeah. wisdom and how it will play out, yeah. even if you may not ultimately be that accurate mm. when you try to formulate public policy. Right, right. I, I got a curious question, and I know we're running out of time, but this whole idea of passion and people, um, if they pursue their passion, uh, they might find this uh, return. That means the results go down, which means maybe the, the finances go down a little bit, but the return of joy and other things uh, might increase. And you talked about this before this. Um, what is your view in terms of that? Like, um, should people pursue or should people just stay with what they have? keep going towards whatever they feel that they were and just ignore this whole idea of passion. So far be it from me to tell someone what their purpose in yeah. life should be, right? Everyone's different, yeah. Everyone's different. And yeah. just as important, everyone has to find it yes. within themselves. Yeah. Now, given that you have found it or you think you're you are iterating toward where you think you'd like to be, yeah. I think that we shouldn't not that we shouldn't, it's, it's difficult to completely dissociate ourselves from society, but to the extent that we can, we try to not allow the expectations of society to overly shape what then we decide we want to do. So mm -hmm. the example we were discussing before the show was, what if you had this job, mm. perhaps a well-paying job, perhaps a job that gives a certain amount of prestige. You yep. were a doctor mm. or a lawyer yep. and you decide, no, I really, really like baking. Yeah. And I'm miserable all the time. Yeah, I'm miserable all the time yeah, all doing the time. law yeah. and dealing with with belligerent uh, <laughs> yeah. clients and yeah. I would very, very much rather bake a chocolate cake yeah. and a really good chocolate cake. Yeah. And some people make that decision, right? Yeah. Sometimes it may turn out to be one that is remunerative and they end up becoming even wealthier than if they were to stick to yeah. uh, their original profession. But at other times, they may choose something that ends up not being as yeah. remunerative. But you have, And the level differs for everyone, but you have to ask yourself, yeah, maybe I'm happy making this yeah. labor-leisure trade-off. Yeah. Maybe I'm happy earning just a little bit less, mm -hmm. but yet finding it so much more fulfilling yes. what I do every day. I don't exist 
I live. Yeah. And I want all of us yeah. to agitate toward living mm. rather than just existing. And yeah. then, I don't know, vesting your dreams on the next generation yeah. and putting your poor kid through your expectations and mm. trying to live vicariously through yeah. them. No, no, they should find their own dreams yeah. and pursue their own passions. You you go find your own. Yeah, I totally resonate with that. And I do feel that this um, there is that standard that you mentioned that society places and from usually it's from your peers and usually it's from the Facebook <laughs> groups, the Facebook friends that you have. It's like, hey, this person and this, this person. Okay, so then this is the standard mm. now. I'm going to just template that to my life and okay, I'll just stick to my job and because it, I'm affording that kind of lifestyle. But actually, in, in essence, maybe you don't even care about that lifestyle. And, and to be fair, yeah. it's tough, right? It's tough because it's tough. we are social creatures. We are. And yeah. comparison is common. In fact, I, we spoke about comparison earlier on. Yeah. You want to compare so that you can aspire toward yes. greater heights. But at the same time, when you're comparing for something that you don't care for, that's when exactly. you have to ask yourself, yeah. am I doing this consciously yeah. or am I just absorbing this? Yeah. And I think leaving the country as I did for a number of years and finding myself and seeing some possibilities mm -hmm. elsewhere for yeah. how society can be organized, how people can live lives of meaning and purpose, yeah. uh, how one can flourish, mm -hmm. made me realize that you know there is a lot more than maximizing per capita GDP. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I know this sounds heretical as an yeah. economist, yeah. but there is a lot more than that. And so if we choose to deviate, we do have to learn a little bit mm -hmm. how to insulate ourselves from yeah. these societal expectations. Yeah. For me, I thankfully, I lean a lot on my wife who mm -hmm. has also been able to look beyond yeah. and uh, to say that, yeah, there are sometimes, especially when crisis strikes, certain things that just matter most yeah. for us and for I think many people, it's family. Yeah. And you yeah. mentioned you have many kids. Yeah, I have six kids. Yeah. So yeah. So that decision is also like it's tough. Yeah. And and yet no no, <laughs> but yeah, at the same time, sometimes when crunch time comes and you're forced to make a decision and mm. or when you lose something. Yeah. I don't know, you know, let, let's say that knock on wood, there was a scam and you yeah. lost money. Yeah. It sucks. And yeah. of course you that money could have been used for much better mm. purposes and so on and so forth. But then you think back, what still matters most in mm. life? For me, it's family. Relationships. I yeah. still, in relationships, I yeah. still have them. Yeah. My wife is still with me. I still yeah. have my daughter. Mm. My mom is still with me. It's yeah. The people I care about, yeah. my sister. And as long as those are still there, then I kind of recalibrate. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, yeah, the loss sucks, yeah. but then... I can move on. So I think the anchor is mm. really important to help us sometimes to dissociate from mm. societal pressures and inevitable yeah. Facebook or whatever, like you yeah. say, WhatsApp mm. chats that yeah. uh, sometimes subtly or not so subtly you try to compare. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, La last question, Jim. Is, um, as a, I love life hacks, right? And I just want to find out from you as an economist, what would be one life hack that you kind of like you think that, okay, I think this is going to benefit a lot of people. Yeah. So here's the textbook answer, right? But yeah. I think it's a textbook answer that's actually very profound. Okay. So economists believe in this uh, the principle mm -hmm. of opportunity cost. It's not just we believe. We, we consistently teach our, our undergraduates and try to get them to think in this manner. Right. So the idea of opportunity cost is what was the next best thing mm -hmm. that you had to forego in order to do the thing that you chose. So why that's useful, just at the surface level, is that at least it forces you to think about trade-offs. Right. What did you give up uh, and what f in, in order to get what you did? And by thinking that way, at least you convince yourself that your choice was correct because mm. you consciously chose to do this rather than the other thing. Yep. So hopefully if by thinking it through, you realize actually I'd rather do the other thing, then you just switch over and you do the other thing instead. 
but it's also more general. Uh, it, if you're trying to make big decisions in life, like what we were talking about, deciding to give up a job or a career mm. for something else, you can weigh it all down mm. as a matter of what is the thing that you're giving up uh, in order to pursue this thing. Mm. And s perhaps you'll come to realize that the thing that you're giving up just isn't worth that much to yeah. you. Yeah. And what really matters a lot more is this other thing, then mm. absolutely you should switch because that is how you will constantly, uh, I hate to use this word because we were just talking about how we shouldn't do this, but that's how you re-optimize your life. Mm. Yeah. Uh, to word, uh, just Im importantly, not just monetary, yep. but also non-pecuniary factors, things that matter yeah. the most to you. Oh, mm. And that, it's not for me to say what it is for you, yeah. but uh, at the very least, going through the exercise of opportunity costs and, and weighing those out, those options out, uh, helps you to systematically make decisions in a way that mm. hopefully minimizes regret. Great. I, 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 when I think about this, I think about um, a framework I have in life uh, where there are four basic um, areas where any everybody kind of like focuses on. First one is your health, relationship, wealth, and joy. So there are these four areas where we have a finite number of almost like um, finite number of coins where we can actually place into these. If you place a lot of emphasis on your wealth, then maybe your relationships, your joy, and then your health suffers. So it's it's about having a finite number of coins where we can place into it and where do you want to invest. And that this opportunity cost means that there is a finite number. Mm. If you keep going to your wealth and then you have zero joy at work, is that what you really want? Or you can have some joy and then have less finances, but you're really happy because you have more time with your family and all that. And that's the opportunity cost. Absolutely. Thank you so much, James, for this time. And I am so glad that you're here sharing with everybody about your passion about being an economist and continually serving the nation with all that skill set. So thank you so much. It's my pleasure, Jason.